Good morning, everyone. This is Dee Miles. I work with the Working Class Think Tank, which is an activity of the Working Class Project. Um, and before I turn the mic over to our presenters this morning, I'd like to uh, let you know of some upcoming activities uh, to which you're invited. On Monday, September 16th, we will have a workshop at 7 p.m. Eastern, Monday, September 16th at 7 p.m. Eastern. And the topic will be egocentrism versus collectivity, navigating the ego. That is a workshop sponsored by the Mental Health for Activists uh, Collective. Then on Sunday, September 22nd at 11 a.m. Eastern, we will have a book talk on white poverty, the new book written by Reverend William Barber on the morning of Sunday, September 22nd at 11 a.m. Eastern. Lastly, in terms of what I will share with you this morning, it uh, is a mini, M-I-N-I, -I, a mini series entitled Dialectics, Strategy, and the United Front Against Fascism. That series will run from September 28th, Saturday, September 28th, starting at 11 a.m. to Saturday, October 5th. And there will also be two sessions on Tuesday and Thursday evening from 7 p.m. Eastern until 8.30 p.m. Eastern. So that is a mini M-I-N-I series on dialectics, strategy, and the United Front Against Fascism. So we hope you will attend uh, the upcoming activities. You are definitely invited, but with no further delay, I will turn the mic over to our first presenter this morning, Alvaro. Yes, good morning. Uh, the, again, the name is Alvaro from Texas, uh, of a retired uh, technical worker in the petrochemical industry. And my topic this morning is Get Real, Understanding Objectivity versus Subjectivity. I hope you can see my screen. Okay, this is only an overview. You are encouraged to do further readings on this philosophical category. Uh, one of the first ones is on Ludwig Feuerbach and the End of Classical German Philosophy by Frederick Engels. It's a very good summation of his philosophy on uh, or, or Marx's view on philosophy. Next is Socialism, Utopian or Scientific by Frederick Engels. And thirdly, Materialism and the Dialectical Method by Maurice Cornforth. So this is further ma uh, reading material that would uh, enhance your understanding of this, of this topic. So what is the purpose of this class? Uh, we want a just and peaceful world. We want to understand the real world to be more effective in helping create social change. A common real fact-based vision helps us unite for a better world. We have a common vision, then we're better, more united. This class can help us identify fake news spread by the ruling class. The ruling class wants to maintain things as they are. The ruling class manufactures consent by misleading us with false views of the world. So I mentioned this was uh, a category of philosophy. So what is philosophy? It's a way to look at the world and try to make sense of it. Philosophy is and always has been class philosophy. Keep that in mind. A revolutionary working class party needs a revolutionary working class philosophy. Philosophy helps us understand the whole instead of just individual parts. That is very important that we understand the whole picture, not just a part of the picture. So objectivity and subjectivity are philosophical categories within Marxist uh, uh, philosophy, much like the following quant quantitative versus qualitative, universal versus particular, old versus new, and form versus content. And there are many other uh, categories, but this is just some examples. So why does philosophy matter? Which is the topic to this today. The real world impacts our outlook on life. Our outlook in life impacts our behavior, and our behavior impacts the real world. So that's why it's important that we uh, that we look at philosophy and, and try to understand it. So what is subjectivity, the topic today? 
uh, to get real, to understand the real world instead of a virtual world that only exists in our minds. Reaching an understanding based on facts. And thirdly, feet firmly planted in the ground. So what is subjectivity? It's looking at the world as though it was just an expression of our inner thoughts. A vision without evidence. Wishful thinking. Philosophical speculation and unwarranted sweeping generalizations, pure fantasy. Feet are firmly planted in the air. So is there a place in working class politics for ideals? And the answer is absolutely. If we are interested in real social change, then our working class activism must be correspond to the real objective world. That's how we would uh, put in place our ideals. So what are some current examples of subjectivity? Uh, the extreme right on China, immigrants, and almost everything else. Very bourgeois radicalism versus working class politics. Utopianism, grandiose schemes made out of pure fantasy. Left-wing communism and infantile disorder based on frustration, inexperience, and the influence of petty bourgeois radicalism. Another example is right reformism or social democracy, thinking that the struggles for reform is all that is needed. It helps maintain the status quo capitalism. Voluntarism is another example. Just because you think it or will it, that does not make it so. So these are all just like examples of subjectivism. This is one of my favorite cartoons. On the left is March for Science, and on the right is March for Alternative Facts, and that's led by Trumpers. This is one of my favorite uh, sayings. Uh, you're entitled to your own opinion, but you're not your own facts. Disbelief in science isn't skepticism, because that's the way uh, it's, uh, this uh, subjectivism is clothed in, is, is and named as skepticism. It's a form of willful ignorance. So disbelief in science isn't skepticism, it's a form of willful ignorance. The question whether objective truth can be attained by human thinking is not a question of theory, but it's a practical question. So we're dealing with practical issues today. So humans, uh, human consciousness is an, age, is an agent of change. Humans are also part of the objective world. It is impossible to separate thoughts from matter that thinks. Matter is the subject of all changes, says Frederick Engels. Subjectivity, a form of false consciousness, detracts from human liberation. That's why we're addressing it this morning. How about working class consciousness? Class consciousness refers to the awareness by a social or economic class of their positions and interests within the structure of the economic order and social system in which they live. Consciousness is therefore from the very beginning a social product, says Karl Marx in his book, German Ideology. Class consciousness can become a force for change if it reflects the real world. The final causes of all social changes and political revolutions are to be sought not in people's brains, not in people's better insights into eternal truths and justice, but in changes in the mode of production and exchange. This comes from Karl Marx. So here's an economic demand uh, that was put forth. Uh, we are worth more, uh, fight for 15. So this is a slogan of a Service Employees International Union and their campaign for uh, increases in the minimum wage to $15 an hour in a union. And uh, now that is, has happened in many states in, in, in the United States. And it's already, uh, the, the struggle now is for higher minimum wage than that. Although not in Texas, where it's still $7.25 an hour. So in summary, objectivity in our thinking is helpful in the process for real change, but we got to keep it real. Next panelist. All right. Well, uh, thank you um, for the the invitation to uh, present today. I think this topic is a really important one. Um, so let's start by kind of defining our terms. Um, subjectivity uh, is what happens in our consciousness, in our minds. So our sensations, our perceptions, our thoughts, ideas, feelings, memories, beliefs are subjective. They depend on our mind, they can't exist without our mind. 
Um, sensations can't exist without a sensory apparatus to receive them and a consciousness to process them. Thoughts can't be thought or feelings felt without a thinking and feeling subject. Objective uh, reality, on the other hand, happens outside of our consciousness, independently of our senses, our thoughts, or our feelings. This distinction is extremely important in Marxism. So one of the basic tenets of Marxism uh, is materialism. That's the idea that the universe, the world, reality, uh, exists uh, outside, exists objectively. Um, nature and society exist independently of our consciousness. Our sense perceptions, uh, what we see, what we hear, uh, et cetera, are reflections of that objective reality, that, that thing that exists outside of our minds. Um, in other words, the universe that Alvaro lives in uh, or that D lives in is the same universe that I live in. And this is an important point that we're going to come back to later. Um, it sounds like an incredibly basic idea uh, that the existence of the universe, the laws of the natural world, don't depend on what I think about them and I can't change them by an act of will. That sounds really, really simple. But um, in looking at kind of what people say about this question, uh, I was anyway surprised at, at how much um, pushback against that idea there is, especially um, from kind of the, the intellectuals of the ruling class. Um, so uh, when we talk about Marxism as a science, when we talk about scientific socialism, uh, this is kind of what we mean. Marxism isn't just a set of beliefs, uh, it's a creed that we choose to accept or reject, um, you know, this piece of it or that piece of it. Uh, it's not eclectic. Uh, we don't conduct our analysis or set our strategy based on what sounds most revolutionary, what we think will appeal to, you know, other leftists. Those are, those are all subjective questions. But Marxism, we know, and, and this is sort of what Marx says about philosophy, uh, is a method for understanding the world and changing it. Um, our science, our analysis, our strategy is measured against objective reality, measured in fact by our ability to uh, consciously intervene and uh, change reality. Uh, the proof of the pudding is in the doing, uh, is something that Engels says uh, at a few different points. Right? Um, the, the, the way we know our analysis is correct is by our ability to change uh, the world. So it's simple then, right? Uh, switch off the subjectivity, get to that objective world, the, get down to brass tacks, a sober analysis of, of concrete conditions, um, right? If you're looking at me right now like I might be on some bullshit, you're right. Your subjectivity isn't something that we can just turn off. It's part of being human. Without it, we wouldn't be able to do the most basic thing that humans do, which is to use our bodies and minds to consciously transform the world around us. That's what work is in, 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 in the Marxist perspective, right? Um, and even beyond that, subjectivity plays an important role in how we construct knowledge about the world. Um, but it can also get in the way of that process. Uh, our, 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 our thoughts and feelings, our own conceptions, um, our, our ego uh, impulses can get in the way of seeing the world as it is. And I want to talk about that for um, a couple minutes before, before finishing up. Um, we said before that the universe has an objective existence, right? Its laws don't depend on our perception of how it works or on our opinion of how it should work. It exists independently of consciousness. But we can't say the same thing about subjectivity with respect to the objective uh, reality. Um, and part of the reason for that is that our bodies, including our brains and our, our sense organs that we use to perceive the world, are actually part of objective reality. And so is our society, our, our position within it. Our class, uh, our position within capitalist production, for example, is a matter of objective reality, while our class consciousness, the degree to which we perceive and identify 
with our class and its interests is on the individual level, a subjective matter, right? So we can't ever uh, um, separate our subjectivity from the objective world. The, the objective world shapes how we uh, come to our ideas um, in, uh, in a few different ways. Um, and this is also something that kind of complicates the materialist picture that we sketched out, right? So in the century and a half since Marx's death, we've learned a lot about uh, the different ways in which um, objective material reality shapes our subjectivity, shapes our ideas and our perceptions and our feelings, right? We, you know, we talk about neurodivergence, about trauma, both acute and chronic, and its after effects, um, about substance use, about how our bodies produce and regulate neurotransmitters like dopamine and serotonin. Um, we recognize that our sensory apparatus is configured in all kinds of different ways, um, different levels of tactile sensitivity, visual acuity, mobility, responsiveness to different types of sensory input. You know, a visual people who are visual learners versus auditory learners versus kinesthetic learners. Um, all of these are rooted in objective material reality, but they have a very profound influence on how we perceive the world. And in fact, how we sort of use those perceptions uh, to come up with ideas and beliefs. And in addition to those sort of physiological uh, characteristics, we might also think of social ones. Um, think of racism, uh, for example. Um, racism is an objective feature of our society. It's not just a belief that some people have in the superiority of white people or the inferiority of people of color. It's a set of economic, legal, social, and political institutions that subject people of color to hyper-exploitation and oppression in order to secure the power of the ruling capitalist class. Those institutions function regardless of whether I recognize, accept, endorse, or profit from them. And part of the way that they um, work in, you know, my experience of society as a, as a white person is to hide their own functioning, right? Um, society does not force me to confront white supremacy in the same way that it forces uh, people of color to confront it. In fact, it tries to hide the workings of racism. It tries to, you know, prevent me from noticing both racism itself and um, how racism contributes, intensifies uh, my own exploitation and oppression, right? So racism, the influence of racism, deforms my subjectivity. It prevents me, it works to prevent me from perceiving the world as it is, uh, perceiving what is necessary in order to change the world. Class consciousness kind of works that same way. Um, so if we if subjectivity has this, in, you know, if we can't get out of it, if we can't turn it off, if we can't just look at objective reality as it is, if, if, if our own experiences and our own ways of perceiving things are always in play, how do we come to understand the objective world, let alone change it, right? How do we um, get past our subjectivity or, or how do we make our subjectivity contribute to um, a, a process of positive social change? Well, the answer is collectivity, right? Um, so Lenin identifies kind of in passing in, in, in a work called Materialism and Imperial Criticism, the very deep connection between uh, materialism, between the belief in an objective reality and democracy, right? Because think about it, how could we have equality or democracy without an objective world? If each of us lived in our own subjective reality, if our thoughts could shape the world around us, all we would have is, you know, the clash of, of subjectivities. You know, is the world going to be determined by my subjectivity or by Alvaro's or by K's, right? The 
objective existence of the world has, is extremely important politically, Lenin tells us, because it's kind of the common ground. It's the thing that we all have access to where we can come together, where we can all participate in the process of constructing knowledge. And that um, is something that gets lost under capitalism. Right? Knowledge is a collective product. None of us can produce accurate knowledge of the world on our own. We need to work collectively. And this isn't just Marxists that have recognized this, the scientific method, right? Where we you know, design experiments that can be uh, repeated, data that can be shared and verified. That's a way of collectively producing knowledge about the world. So is you know, the way we configure our collective work in the party. Um, how can we all contribute our own experiences, our own uh, analysis to this knowledge of the objective world that none of us have access to um, on our own? And I think I'm going to uh, stop with that and just underline once again that um, our access to, our ability to understand and consciously change the world around us depends on our ability to uh, work collectively. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Alvaro. Before we open the floor for discussion, we will have one more presenter. So our last presenter is Kay. Kay, you have the floor. Thanks. Um, so I'm Kay. I use they, them pronouns. I am based in New York. I organize with the Queens Club, and we're going to talk about objectivity and subjectivity. So people are coming to this discussion with some preconceived ideas. So quick test, right? If a tree falls in a forest and no one is around to hear it, does it make a sound? Uh, this is kind of a classic question from philosophy. Some think of it as a trick question. The point of asking questions like these is less about the final answer than it is about how we get that final answer. So in this case, the answer depends on what we call a sound. Some think about the physics of the situation and say that sound is just the vibration through the air, right? I put in earphones so I can hear the vibrations. Um, others think about their personal experience of the world and say that sound requires someone to hear it, right? There's probably something going on in the middle of the ocean, but nobody is there. So I can't say that that's a sound, right? Let's take a quick detour into philosophy to get an answer to this. So there's two ways we can think about reality, right? There's one way called materialism that says ultimately reality depends on or is a form of matter that moves. And here matter is just whatever is outside of our minds, outside of us, that causes us to experience the world the way we do. Another way to look at it is through idealism. Philosophically speaking, idealism is a claim that reality ultimately depends on or is a form of consciousness or ideas, just purely. Um, ideas are just the contents of some sort of mind that acts on them. Uh, don't ask me how that works. I'm not an idealist, but there are people who make these claims, right? So as materialists, we admit the existence of matter first and foremost. It's in the name, materialist. So our falling tree still makes a sound because it interacts with the air, regardless of our presence. So speaking kind of broadly, what aspects of the world exist without human beings or independently of human beings is everything outside of our minds and how we see the world um, as individuals and maybe even collectively. So we're going to expand these ideas of objective and subjective to deal with them as we find them in history. So on the next slide, I have some images. I want you to take a second to use what you think of as subject or subjective or subjectivity uh, to pick which images are subjects. All right. So I hope everyone picked out the top two images. We recognize these as people who have or had their own personal, or we could say subjective, experiences of the world. But in a sense, all of these images represent subjects. And how we represent them 
depends on what point in history we look at them from. For example, are women people? I assume everyone in this webinar thinks so, but humanity as a whole hasn't given a final answer on this question yet. As we know from recent history, some who oppose the idea of women as people are holding office in our country right now. So do we treat women like people? Why or why not? And how does that affect our politics? And what about black people? Are we people or property, subjects or objects? Again, is uh, an open question, historically speaking. I definitely think I'm a person and a subject, but there have been people who have argued that black people are objects until it's legally useful for them, right? So we can punish black people, thinking of US slavery, uh, for committing crimes, but they don't get any of the rights of uh, a normal citizen. And what about Walmart, right? Well, in law, we treat corporations like people in some senses. There's this idea of natural persons, people like me, humans, and there's an idea of legal persons, which we just pretend they're people so they can exist in our legal framework. And what does that mean in terms of how society works, right? So in history, subjects are not necessarily people and objects just might be people sometimes. How did this happen? Well, I used Google to look up how often people wrote the word subject in English from 1619 to about two years ago. For those of you who don't know, Google has digitized millions of books, magazines, and other texts, uh, at least a third of all that exists by their estimation, so we can get a good idea of the evolution of words over time. So we look at this chart, and I don't know if you can see the dates, but there's a little lift and then a big jump starting at about 1750, and that high point is in the 1800s in the use of the word subject in English. But we know that something was happening around that time in the English world. Capitalism and the Industrial Revolution were taking place, right? Exactly from 1760 to 1848, according to our trusty Wikipedia, uh, this Industrial Revolution, or at least the first one, was contained within this time period where subjects started to appear more often in print. And if we look at the dictionary around that time too, the economic and political situation becomes clear as well, right? It's somebody who owes their allegiance to a sovereign, like a king or something, or a country, and is governed by its laws, right? And they enjoy the rights and franchises and all that stuff. So that's where this is coming from. And if you read Marx and Engels also around this time, they set up their materialist conception of history in their text, A Critique of the German Ideology. And the idea of a subject that ignores this historical context is one of the things they're critiquing. So this idea of a subject didn't come out of nowhere. It comes out of property relations around this time where we're transitioning from feudalism to capitalism. So, Historically speaking, subjective reality is reality from within human thinking. Objective reality is reality outside of human thinking. Now, where do our thoughts come from? Because we're talking about human thinking. They come from real life. We have to eat. We need clothes and shelter to protect us from weather, predators, and pests. Nature doesn't give us these things ready-made. We need to do work on nature to get or prepare them. And we need other people get more people and to teach them what it is to be human. And so that's the materialist starting point. If you read the German ideology, that's where they start. And so objective and subjective reality interact, right? Everyone who's ever lived came into existence in an environment that made them out of the things in that environment. And that applies from the material level to the personal and interpersonal and mental levels, all the way up to the social and societal level. But the influence doesn't go one way, right? we can also affect our environment, right? We all exist in a single reality. And so when I think of the grandest testament to the reality of this interaction between objective and subjective, I think of climate change, right? Since the industrial revolution, humans have begun to rely on energy sources like coal, oil, natural gas, to enhance our ability to do the work that sustains our lives. Uh, these energy sources are powerful, but when we burn these fuels, Right, the byproducts of that heat they release remain in the air and trap heat from the sun. So here we see a graph of this happening, and the average uh, temperature is going up 
as time passes, right? 2016 and 2020 were tied at that time for the hottest years on record. This chart comes from NASA, by the way. So the amount of heat that is added to the atmosphere is like nothing that has been seen caused by animals um, in the history of the planet, as far as we can see, All right? And this is going to have a very powerful effect, right? I have an animal bothering me right now. This exists outside of me and is causing noise. Um, so here we see a growing human population combined with the way that the population organizes itself to achieve its needs and wants. Uh, we call that the economy. It creates a feeling in people that something is very wrong, right? This comes from a contradiction between working together on a global scale and only a few people getting the benefits of that working together, right? So with this, we had the idea of Marxism, right? The issue is the, uh, the way the economy is organized and we need collective action to change the situation. And crucially, we need to understand how that interaction works. So just to finish up, we need to get this idea right because we can change the subjective at will, right? I can choose to think something else right now. I can think about a cup of water, for example, but I can't choose to fly out of my seat and you know fly around the globe because that's just not something that can objectively happen, right? If I wanna do that, I have to do science. And so we do that, uh, we do science and we build technologies based on those sciences and that's how we know that they work. And so the same thing happens with Marxism. We use Marxism because there was a critique of capitalism, right? Capital is a critique of capitalism by Marx. And that critique has been and continues to be effective. And so because capitalism hurts us now, we act with a goal to get it to stop hurting us. And that's why we use uh, Marxist philosophy is because it has all of these ideas baked in, ready for us to use and develop based on our conditions now. And we need to organize because we don't believe in fate. Just like capitalism happens because people make it happen. If we want something better, say like socialism, we have to make it happen. Our thoughts, beliefs, and behaviors are just as much a part of reality as the earth and the sun. And we can change those just as much as we are changing the earth. And I'll leave it at that. Well, thank you, Kay. And we'll now open the floor for discussion if you have questions or comments. So we're looking for raised hands. All right, Derek. Hi, great presentation this morning, thank you. Um, my question is, uh, have any of y'all ever read the book or are you familiar with the book History and Class Consciousness by George Lukács? Uh, he was, uh, I think, Hungarian Marxist. And he put forward this idea that uh, that the subject of history, as he put it, the subject of history is the proletariat, that subjectivity is located in the working class as a whole. And um, I, that's about as much justice as I can give the idea. I was wondering what kind of insights y'all might have into that concept. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. We'll take a few more questions and comments if it's okay with our panelists before we turn the mic back over to them. So thank you, Derek. Looking for more raised hands. Paul, we're opening the mic. Okay, I've got to go back to the picture of the young lady in the cowboy hat and the uh, picture of Frederick Douglass, above which is the icon logo of walmart these are apparently thought of as subjective realities or, or subjective objects but i see them as objects and I, I i'm i'm not a philosopher i'm a lawyer but i'm not a philosopher why isn't the picture of the young lady my view of the why is that not an object why is Frederick Douglass, not an object. They are real. They ha they happened. The woman is real, assuming she is. Um, and Walmart is the Walmart logo to me is subjective because it's 
it's an icon that represents a a terrible thing that is masks itself in a smiling a beacon of savings to customers to make life better that is subjective in my opinion please challenge me on that what is the antithesis to what i just said Thank you, Paul. Let's take one more question or comment before we turn it back over to the panelists. Okay, Zinzi, opening your mic on our end. Hi, so thank you for um, answering my question. Um, what I'm thinking is about anti-satellite technology right now. Um, both of these technologies are available in the East and West and I'm actually trying to attend a WHO U United Nations of Outer Space Affairs conference in order to, or symposium white paper, in order to learn more about how to prevent these diseases, including multiple diseases, and um, protection of the entire globe from these essentially um, private industry weapons contra contractors with the United States and NASA. And what I wanted to know is, this, does this make me complicit in this uh, endeavor? My passion has always been for space. I, I was shuttle era as a PhD candidate and I just wanted to know your thoughts on this, uh, whether the importance of it is valuable or um, whether more involvement with this think tank. I am looking for a sponsor, non-financial, uh, just to be able to get to the think tank. Right now, I am. I was forced to resign from my academic position. I am just a little bit too Arab, <laughs> if you know what I mean. <laughs> Thank you, though. Thank you. All right, so we'll turn it back over to our panelists, but we will have time to do one more round. But who would like to start? Scott? Um, sure. Um, on the, the question of, of, of Lukacs, uh, I will admit I, I have not read uh, History and Class Consciousness. Um, it's been on my reading list for a long time. Um, but that notion of the, the proletariat as the subject of history, um, you know, my interpretation of that, um, which, which is again mine and is not, and I haven't read Lukacs, um, but uh, is that right now under capitalism, um, historical initiative rests with the working class, right? There's a there's a need for the working class to uh, lead the next big uh, process of, of revolutionary social change. Um, it's capitalism is falling apart. It, its contradictions are becoming overwhelming, uh, right? Um, the contradiction that, that Kay mentioned between um, co between social production and private appropriation. Um, the working class uh, has the solution to move beyond that, or, you know, to a, to a system based on collective production and collective um, uh, appropriation and, and use. Um, and uh, I guess that's what I wanted to contribute. Thank you. All right, Kay, uh, you can choose uh, whatever you'd like to respond to. Sure. Um, I would like to speak to the question of the woman and the picture of the woman and Frederick Douglass and Walmart. They're real, so why aren't they objective? If I understand correctly, that's the question. So this kind of gets deeper into the philosophy part of it. Uh, when we're thinking about uh, what dialectics means, it means that there is a whole, uh, one thing that we're talking about that you can view uh, for your purposes as two things that interact with one another that are somehow fundamentally opposed and that cause each other to develop. And so in this case, these people and Walmart are both 
objects, right? They objectively exist. They're real. We can both go to a Walmart. We can both see where Frederick Douglass lived and died. And we can find out who that woman is and <laughs> what her life is like. But um, they also have and create subjective experiences. In the case of the actual people, uh, they have consciousness like we do. Uh, and so they observe the world with intention and they operate on the world and change it. Um, in one case, to allow people to use public domain photo in a presentation in the case of the woman. In Frederick Douglass's case, uh, to campaign worldwide for the abolition of slavery in the United States. Um, and so these interactions between the objective and subjective are fundamental, right? One creates the other. If we think even in the big, big, big picture, scientifically, right, there was the objective world that was doing its thing, as we know. And eventually, we came upon life, right? And that life then developed the ability to think and to act with intention. Uh, and so now here we are, right? So the objective developed the subjective out of it, the ability to have a perspective and to then go back and act on that world, right? So there really is just one reality that we're all inside of uh, within which we interact. We just call the part that I'm not in a first person perspective uh, looking out of, that's objective, right? Whereas the subjective is that part that I call that I have a first person view of, right? So like if I disappeared off the face of the earth, you would still have your subjective experience. If you disappeared, I would still have my subjective experience. And the reason that we both uh, have those subjective experiences regardless of other people disappearing is because we exist objectively. So that kind of gets more into the philosophy, but really it's talking about there's one phenomenon, right? And that gives us the objective side and the subjective side. And that phenomenon we call reality as materialists. Okay, Alvaro, do you have any uh, responses to the questions and comments from participants? Uh, yes, in general, I would like to address the question that was posed by Derek. Uh, about George Lucas and, and the issue of uh, a working class. Uh, working class conscious, it, it, it goes to the heart of consciousness. And, and consciousness is a uh, consciousness is is a social product. It's a reflection of of class relationships in society or a lack of. Uh, most workers in society, the working class, come to an understanding of class, comes to a class conscious understanding. I think one word that, that would help to clarify this whole issue of, of the human mind versus objectivity has to do with reflection. So think about the human mind is matter that thinks and it's reflected on the real world using our senses. In, uh, and that can be an actual, as close as possible to reflection of the real world, or it could be a distorted reflection uh, based on all kinds of other precepts or our, uh, or, or ways of thinking. And uh, so, so that that is that is very important, but it does go at the very heart of the issue of, of class consciousness and, and socialist consciousness. So we have to think in terms of how do we arrive at that social product and uh, and that is part of our work that's that's all i had okay i did read lukox uh years ago though and so it sounds like you all captured the essence of it okay you wanted to say something else yes to the last question about the person who was looking to go to the uh the space conference um there's an <laughs> Again, because of how the interaction between the objective and subjective works. Uh, the answer is yes, you are complicit, but that's not a moral judgment. That's just how we exist in society, right? There are very real objective boundaries to how our society works that cause you to, if you're interested in space, you have to interact with people who may be weapons manufacturers 
or uh, maybe other people who aren't weapons manufacturers, but um, may work with them because that's might have been the only way in their life that they could have gotten there. So the the complete view to that is also that whatever uh, whenever you participate, you have the ability to influence things. So I think of, for example, in the sciences, uh, J. Robert Oppenheimer, as an example, as a scientist who was complicit in making the atomic bomb, uh, but afterward was one of the main campaigners against the existence of atomic weapons. Um, and so it is possible to be complicit in something and also to be complicit in uh, the downfall of that thing. Uh, and so I think because I'm also going to be starting my PhD soon in computer science, there's a lot of nasty uh, corporations and things like that that exist in technology. And might I be complicit in receiving funding from things that are ultimately sourced from those corporations? Yes, but what do I intend to do with those things? Um, well, we have to look at the objective conditions and organize. You know, there are tech workers who are organizing. There are scientists who are organizing, for example, against the war that's going on, the genocide that's going on in Palestine. So it's not a an either or thing. You can be, uh, you can enter into an activity in order to halt that activity or to explore something different there. Thank you very much. Let's take another round of comments, questions, and before we end for the morning. Dan, your mic is unmuted on our end. Thank you for your presentation. So I have a question. Um, what is the objective reality of the dead zone in the Gulf of, Gulf of Mexico off New Orleans? What does Marxism say about this? Is a dead zone an idea? or reality or both thank you dan looking for other comments and questions gene okay well first of all i thought this was a, a excellent treatment of a very uh pertinent subject because there because capitalism encourage encourages idealism the reason is because if you're uh, idealistic you can be convinced of almost anything and uh just as evidence of that right now at this moment, millions of people are in church practicing their idealism. So, but my question has to do with the intrusion of uh, materialism onto idealism. In other words, truth will out, as some people say, and some people say that the arc of, of uh, history swings towards justice, as Martin Luther King put it. In other words, I think that one reason that communists are so hopeful about the future is that truth and materialism tend to teach their own lessons and i think one example of that right now is the is the climate change i think that the heat which is, is going to be 106 uh, uh, during this week here in dallas i think the heat is making a lot of people vote democrat so i just wonder if people have a comment about that thank you thank you gene Looking for other raised hands. Okay, Mushin. Thank you, Comrade Case presentation. Talked about the rise of capitalism in the period. Question is, why did that happen? Capitalism because capital. If you look at the Britain's economy before, before the period, there was not Britain that was barely finished with a very poor economy. But during the period that you show the rise in capitalism is the time about the, the group from the India started to come into in in in, in UK. That was probably the basis for the capital. That's what, and that loot came from eastern part of the Indian subcontinent, where the British first colonists started to colonize. And essentially, it literally stole the resources that were present by present and caused the famine there uh, by, by extraction. So that is how the, that revolution started. To take. That's what I add to that. Thank you. Thank you, Mushin. All right. So uh, this is our last round. I'll look again. Ben, click the picture of the mic on your control panel to open the mic. There you are, Ben. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I just share my thoughts, really. Um, 
uh, the distinction between subjectivity and objectivity and how they interact in dialectics, which I found interesting, and how that determines uh, working class organisation uh, and the working class as a collective subject. So, and in order to combat false ideas and distortions, I think the word was used, and emphasise in philosophy and science. Um, I think a key text is Marx's critique of the philosophy of right, where he advocates the, this idea where the working class needs to emancipate itself through grasping science and philosophy um, and combating these distorted ideas within our class, like racism and uh, idealistic uh, ideas. And just the idea of science uh, and distinct from technology, where science, I think back in the Soviet Union, the distinction was made between proletarian science and bourgeois science. And to what extent does that hold? A scientific practice within capitalist societies, how much science is distorted by false ideas? And whether with a socialist society, uh, scientific law, there's still remain, but the practice will differ, you know, not making weapons and uh, militaristic uh, applications and so on, uh, but more towards human emancipation. Yeah, that's what I share so far. Thank you, Ben. Antonio. Hey, good morning, everybody. This is a great presentation. Um, I was reading uh, before the presentation the three sources and the three component parts of Marxism by Karl Marx and Frederick Engels. And um, this dovetails uh, right into the first few pages that I was reading. So I really appreciate it. Um, I, um, I, I believe that, um, that, that spirituality and materialism can coexist. Uh, I've always felt that. And um, it reminds me of a phrase that I had read in the past that said, the reconciliation of opposites arrives maybe when humans as individuals are able to recognize the importance of developing a true balance of the material and the spiritual in their lives. Thank you. Okay, and we want to recall Engels, uh, Engels point, um, and I think even diehard materialists in this day and time would refer to this point, which is that the fight is against capitalism, not spirituality or God, the concept of God. So Engels point was that the fight is against capitalism, not God. All right, Adam, your mic is open on our, there you are, Adam. Um, I wanted to make a comment on the last round of questioning, the last question the woman spoke for. Uh, I myself work in the aerospace industry. Primarily, we do work with military contractors. So I kind of wanted to extend a question to the presenters as well as kind of help her out as well. I, I myself like to think that my subjective reality, my subjective beliefs on what I'm doing and why I'm doing it, while they don't trump the objective reality, I do like to think that it does affect what ends up happening. So while I don't believe in the perpetuation of, say, the military industrial complex, and that is my subjective reality, while it does not trump what I'm objectively doing, it is a good start in understanding how the objectivity can be changed and also taking a bit off of, you know, your own uh, kind of worry to the materialistic conditions of either your wants or your needs, right? So I need a job, I need to get paid. Unfortunately, this is one of the best opportunities I've found to do so in my area, but I understand what I can do in order to change that objectivity by looking within my subject, uh, subjective mind of what I believe should be done and what I want to do versus what is being done. So I also wanted to present that question to the presenters on how you think that your subjective beliefs can, while not trumping the objective, help change it and help ease you away from pretty much being in a standstill of 
you know, if there's no ethical consumption under capitalism, then what's the point of doing anything, right? So that's that's more my question. Okay, let's take a final look. Frank? Oh, thank you. Um, well, I've, I've, I think, I feel like maybe I missed something because I'm a little bit confused about something. Like the first speaker did mention, like looking at things as they really are. And there's was so much talk about objectivity and subjectivity that, I mean, to me, like historical materialism and dialectics and all of that is all about looking things as they really are. And I almost feel like folks were saying that, you know, like reality filters your own mind, your own subjectivity, but are you saying that you can't actually see objective reality? You know, look at, look, you can't see things as they really are? Or I guess that's, I know it is, I hope that's not too, you know, discombobulated, but to me, objectivity means looking at things as they really are and you can perceive them. Thank you, Frank. We'll turn the mic back over to our presenters for the last time. Uh, Scott? Thanks. Um, just uh, quickly in, in response to Frank, um, I would say, yes, objectivity is seeing things as they are, trying to get as close as we can to that real world that exists outside of our minds, outside of our perceptions. But again, our whole way of perceiving the world is it's sort of filtered through our subjectivity, right? And that subjectivity also is shaped by the objective world around us. So um, as an individual, it's extremely difficult, you know, uh, to, to get to that uh, on your own, to get to that vision of how things really are, the objective world. Collectively, you know, as a, a class, as a people, as humanity, we can um, advance toward that uh, much more surely. Um, and that's kind of the point of science, which um, I, I really like that point about uh, proletarian versus bourgeois science, um, as it was called in the Soviet Union. Um, I, I would say uh, that there's, you know, there's one objective reality, there's one science, Right? There's a, there are right and wrong ways of doing it. And right now we're in a phase where capitalism is interfering with uh, our ability to come to uh, an understanding, uh, a scientific understanding of the objective world that enables us to intervene in it and, and change it consciously. Right, So we have a university system that um, tries to set people in competition uh, for scarce jobs um, and, that, and that shapes uh, our ability to, um, you know, create to construct knowledge collectively. We have uh, venture capitalists trying to privatize um, new uh, innovations to to turn uh, knowledge that is constructed collectively into a privately owned commodity. That interferes also with our. So all of these capitalism right now is preventing us from constructing scientific knowledge about the world. And that's what I would see getting to Gene's point, you know, about religion and so forth. Religion is not the main what a form of idealism, I would say right now. It's um, it's more uh, like these, you know, tech bro visionaries who think they can just impose, you know, their concept of what the future should be uh, on the rest of us, like Elon Musk sort of. That's what I would see as a much more you know, or, 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 or the reactionaries trying to um, distort our understanding of the world by, by banning books and banning whole areas of inquiry. Th those are what I would see as a much more virulent form of idealism right now. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Um, Alvaro? Yes, uh, thank you for giving an opportunity to respond to some of those questions. Uh, there's some thoughtful questions in there. Uh, the last one starting from Frank, can, can you see or know objective reality? And the answer to that is absolutely. And uh, that's the whole basis of Marxism. And Marx talks about that, that, that whether that is possible or not is not a theoretical question. It's, an, uh, it's a real objective question. It, uh, it's real and it's practical. Uh, the answer is yes, absolutely. You can know reality. You can know the objective truth. You can arrive at it through the scientific method. 
that is gathering the evidence and presenting it and in, in, uh, into a, a collective uh, that can be a peer review or whatever. And uh, so it's always going to be an approximation because uh, human beings are limited, but we do have a lot of senses and we can use them to try to approach uh, reality. It's like saying, do you believe there's a car going across the street at huge velocity and it's, it weighs 4,000 pounds? Well, whether you believe it or not, you would not want to get in front of that car because uh, you, you will see the whole harsh reality of that situation. So there is a real world out there, uh, whether you uh, agree with it or not. Uh, now, going applying that uh, to the question that was asked earlier about the dead zone in the Gulf. Is there such a thing? As much as I know about it, uh, there is a dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico that is, was caused by uh, organic material uh, coming down uh, in the river it, and using up all the oxygen. So there's no oxygen in that zone. And that's, they call it a dead zone for that reason. Does it exist? Absolutely. That's been uh, defined by science. You know, you can go in there, you see that there's no real life in that region. Uh, but it's, it has a cause and it has an objective reality that's been proven. Uh, same thing with the class uh, struggle. Uh, history proves that. And uh, by looking, history is just a reflection of, of reality, uh, is, is experienced by people. Uh, it's practical experience, uh, historical experience. That's all I had to say. Thank you, Alvaro. And uh, Kay? Yes. Let's see. So, yeah. So, the question about whether or not we can see objective reality, well, we certainly can't take our senses for granted uh, because as we've done science over the years, we've come to find entirely new parts of reality that are objective that do have real effects on how we live our lives, but that if you just rely on our five or however many senses you count we have, you wouldn't be able to tell that they're there. Um, for example, we use x-rays. You can't see x-rays, but when you shoot them at somebody's uh, head and you take a picture of that, you can see things that uh, have a real effect on the world. Um, so really, again, the proof of the pudding is in the, the eating or the, the proof of the science, the theory, is in the doing. Uh, as you do things, you figure out whether or not they're true. Um, there were scientists, for example, who thought that atoms were not real. Uh, they were disproven by the people who made the atom bomb and by the people who developed nuclear energy. Right? We're actually doing things with this theory that wouldn't be possible if they weren't objectively true. So that's how we see objective reality. We do things with our theories that we have, our ideas that we have. And so that subjective reality is a starting point for organizing, like Adam was saying. Um, so your subjective beliefs can change objective reality, provided that you act on them, right? Uh, we might have an idea that there is a dead zone off the coast of New Orleans, right? We have to, in order to know about it. Uh, have an idea, but uh, we come to know that it's real, what are we going to do about it, right? Simply knowing that that's true, um, probably because we have our unconscious mind doing things all the time that we can't sense, um, it does affect uh, objective reality pretty immediately, right? If I know something, uh, dangerous is like on the other side of a door that's going to affect how I approach the door or for example if we know something deadly is happening off the coast of New Orleans because of things that we're putting in the water that's going to affect how we look at you know oh, I'm pouring something down the drain oh no is it harming the environment right um, and so that does pile up and people talk about these things and then eventually you get like environmental movements so that's an object of reality we come to know it as an idea again there's a reflection of that idea in our minds and then we can do something about that right we can go to these companies uh, that are presumably dumping water that drains out into the gulf of mexico and hold them to account but uh, to what gene was saying yes capitalism encourages idealism um, there is the idea that somebody brought up of a bourgeois science versus 
a proletarian science. I think they were talking, uh, the, the Soviets in that context were talking about the social sciences. Now, with the social sciences, when you come up with a conclusion, you actually do something in society with that conclusion, right? So there really is a bourgeois social science and a proletarian social science. So you'll note that you can't get like a major in Marxism at most universities in the United States. That's because the people who are funding these universities and who may be teaching at them, the most of them have capitalist ideology uh, running through their veins and running through their mind. And they're funded by capitalist sources. So they're not going to teach Marxism at universities like you may see, say, in a socialist country uh, where you are getting that perspective. Um, so yeah, these, uh, these ideas really do have classes that are associated with them. Not every idea does, but a lot do. Um, let's see. And then I think lastly, uh, spirituality and materialism can coexist. Many of the greatest minds of the last century, like I think of Einstein, just as a freebie, talked about a new religion that may come about that is based on what modern science shows us to be true. And if we look at the history of humanity, people have found different ways to respond to uh, kind of the, the awesome nature of reality. It's like, wow, look at all this stuff that's going on. Look at how amazing it is that I'm here and I'm not over there. And, you know, people have this sort of spiritual religious experience and they use the ideas around them to then construct uh, a religion or a spiritual practice out of that. Uh, and so that won't stop going into the future. That won't stop under socialism. People will still do that, but hopefully we'll have a better idea of what's real and what's not and how to relate to each other uh, so that that religion is something that we can coexist with rather than uh, have to fight against thinking about the uh, religious right here in the United States. Um, so yeah, I think that's all. Okay, I'd like to thank all of our presenters. Thank you, Alvaro. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Kay for the time and effort you put into uh, providing uh, this very interesting conversation uh, for us this morning. Thank you very much. On behalf of all of the participants, we had a little over 70 people this morning, which is uh, not bad. We can do better and we'll try to do better, but thank you very much. Very interesting, very uh, eye-opening. So without further delay, uh, have a good rest of your Sunday, everyone. Thank you for joining in. And we hope to see you at our next activity, September 16th, which will be a conversation concerning egocentrism versus collectivity, sort of a continuation of this conversation in a way. Uh, egocentrism versus collectivity, navigating the ego. So thank you to our panelists. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you to our participants for joining us this morning. Good day. Good day.